Coming up on Stu Does America, Bernie Sanders is selling socialism with a promise of his imminent cataclysmic failure. Topless protesters take out their udders to stop you from eating cheese. And Jonah Goldberg likely rethinks his life after appearing on this stupid show. Make sure to click the bell for notifications on YouTube and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. If you're one of the cool kids, you'll probably include the phrase, it's great, whatever, which hundreds of you actually did, fueling our rise to the number 11 podcast on iTunes. Imagine how Michael Moore, Chris Matthews, and Al Franken felt seeing something called Stu Does America passing their life's work. Keep it up to continue to personally hurt their feelings. This is Stu Does America. Bernie Sanders ever actually accomplished? No, that wasn't rhetorical. I'm actually looking for an answer because you'd think the possible president of the United States would have more than precisely one notable success in his entire curmudgeonly existence. I will say, though, the one success is a pretty big one. But what he has done is taken what used to be the far left of the Democratic Party and put it dead center. We noticed that too, Miranda. Interesting observation there. Do I think Bernie Sanders is a failure? Well, sure. Do you think Bernie Sanders is a failure? Of course. But maybe that's exactly what he wants us to believe. There's a weird thing going on in Bernie world right now as we get further and further down the road to Stalingrad. It's fun to be the insurgent. You always get to be the most pure revolutionary candidate. No one gets to your left. They want to spend $10 trillion on the climate, you're spending 16. They want to ban the Second Amendment, you want to expand the ban to cover slingshots and angry expressions. They want to bring cancel culture to the womb at nine months, well, you're building a disintegration ray for their annoying toddlers. But suddenly, now that Bernie is the front runner, the people around him are realizing, holy crap, Like this this could actually happen. The guy we found living in a barn on top of a pile of horse dung ranting about a socialist utopia, utopia, like Doc Brown describing time travel, might actually be the nominee. It's at this point we start thinking, uh, perhaps this whole Ivan Drago fan club shtick is not the best approach to the average voter. Traditionally, Americans aren't all that fond of socialism. And when it comes down to it, they're probably not picking a guy who's pissed off that West Germany went away over a guy who shows up at the Daytona 500 with a supermodel and a limo called the Beast. But look at it from Bernie's point of view. Sure, you want to win, but you just can't say you're going to abandon all the things you've been promising your voters. You can't look like you're a completely inauthentic liar who would say anything or be anything to acquire one iota of power. In other words, you should never go full Elizabeth Warren. So the Bernie buddies have come up with an innovative solution. It's a new message to voters. Yes, of course, Bernie wants to completely remake the entire economy and nation in his own image. Of course, he wants to make sure that uh, your ownership of that insurance policy you enjoy, that is now a criminal act. And yes, he wants to spend so much of your money that bajillion will become a real word. But don't worry, he will fail. This has been the explicit pitch of the Sanders campaign, mainly in effort to get the support of members of the powerful culinary union ahead of the Nevada caucus. Top Bernie surrogate and inexplicably famous person Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez rolled out this novel explanation as highlighted in this article from Business Insider titled AOC says the quiet part out loud about Medicare for all. It has virtually no chance of becoming law right away. She says, quote, A president can't wave a magic wand and pass any legislation they want. The worst case scenario, we compromise deeply and we end up getting a public option. Is that a nightmare? I don't think so. (laughs) Actually, AOC, the worst case scenario of socialism played out last century with a death count of not one, not two, but 100 million dead worldwide. But I guess that's looking kind of at the whole issue as a glass half empty kind of thing, you know? At least each and every one of them died with universal health care. 
Bernie Friendly writer and Young Turks contributor Ryan Grimm said basically the same thing as AOC, though he used a much higher rate of syllables per word. Hey, Culinary 226, check in with your government affairs people. There are not 60 votes in the Senate to ban the private health insurance you got in your union negotiations, nor will there be after the election. You're going to be A-OK. -okay. In other words, vote for Bernie and hope he fails. Presidential Medal of Freedom winner Rush Limbaugh, which is so fun to say, faced criticism early in the Obama administration for this. I do not want the government in charge of all of these things. I don't want this to work. So I, I'm thinking of replying to the guys, okay, I'll, I'll send you a response, but I don't need 400 words. I need four. I hope he fails. His completely blown out of proportion point was, I, I think the best thing for the country is a less intrusive government. Obama wants a more intrusive government. I'll be rooting against him pulling that off. Well, yeah, Trump thinks less regulation is good for the country. Democrats want more. It's super duper subtle, but you may have detected it. Democrats are currently rooting against his success. Huh. They hope he fails. But the Sanders campaign is a bit groundbreaking in their attempt to make their inevitable failure into a reason to vote for him. Don't worry, he'll never get any of that crap done. Don't worry about it. His failure is a feature, not a bug. Does this work in any situation? Sure, honey, uh, I brought her a couple drinks and took her out to dinner and booked a hotel, but she's like way too hot. She's basically a model. There's no way she was gonna hook up with me. If I could get women like that, why would I be with you? Happy Valentine's Day, honey. When the consequences are so severe, it's just better to avoid the possibility. No need to take the risk. If you live in a 1980s horror movie, don't have awkward sex at camp. Were there several other teenage girls we never saw who hooked up in a lakeside shed and walked away totally fine with the exception of being disappointed in their boyfriend's stamina? I don't know, maybe. But the most efficient path to avoid getting murdered by Jason Voorhees is to not plan your summer vacation at Camp Crystal Lake. And the most efficient path to getting a candidate who won't do the things that Bernie Sanders wants to do is to not vote for Bernie Sanders. Very excited to have Jonah Goldberg on. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Suicide of the West, among many others as well, a host of the popular podcast, The Remnant with Jonah Goldberg, and editor-in-chief of The Dispatch. Most importantly, I think, maybe prominent dog dad. Is that accurate, Jonah? All accurate. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm also a human dad, mm -hmm. uh, so my daughter would, you know, might, might want some credit in there, but sure, that works. <laughs> There's a little controversy there if you do put the dogs above the humans. I've noticed that myself. Um, can we start with the book? Yes. Uh, the Jonah? only thing is, no one, none of my dog's friends will humiliate them at school if I tweet <laughs> about them. But it, it, it works differently with the human daughter. I, I like the person behind me with the hands unconnected to me. That's kind of freaky. Yeah, here's the thing. Um, he, he's he's not being aggressive enough with the hand gestures. I feel like if you want to make wild just gesticulations all over the place, it'll it'll really show up well on film. Okay, just so as it's just hand work yes going on <laughs> i promise yeah. uh that'd be fine okay. nothing illicit they don't allow things like that on the internet jonah so um <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, can we start with a the very book? strong Google filter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go on. Let's do this. <laughs> um uh, suicide of the west is one of my favorite books of the last couple of years I, i've loved it um it's out in paperback now um and it's it's interesting to go l let me start with this because I, I i i've i've seen you ask other people this question before as the ultimate question to ask any author why did you write this book? Yeah. Um, well, it's funny. Uh, had I, you know, so when the book came out in hardcover and I was working on it night and day and all that kind of stuff, I hadn't noticed some of the things that were going on in the world uh, of sort of conservative eggheadery. <laughs> and so one of the most remarkable things to happen uh, since the book came out is that the reception from some people on the right was that a book called Suicide of the West was way too optimistic. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, like, should I have named it Take a Bath with a Toaster? <laughs> um, but, you know, the, look, I think the main reason I wrote the book was that um, I think that one of the main things that 
America writ large, right and left, suffer from these days is a pervasive sense of ingratitude that we don't really recognize how we go- how good we have it in the grand sweep of human history, how we how good we have it compared to the rest of the world, um, and how good we have it compared to how it could be if we turn our backs and make this suicidal choice to sort of abandon liberal democratic capitalism, um, which has lifted humanity. It's the only thing to ever lift humanity out of poverty. Um, and so I wanted to write this book to say, hey, look, this, this sort of tribalism stuff, which is now everywhere and sort of a cliche, is threatening to pull us back into the muck that we come from. And if we don't take active measures to combat it, that's where we'll get dragged because that's what nature does is it drags you back to the muck unless you actively fight it. Uh, despite this Sunshine and Rainbows title of the book, uh, Suicide of yes. the West, I, uh, reading it, I actually, you find it as almost like profoundly both optimistic and pessimistic. I mean, really, I think a lot of us get lost in this day-to-day thing where everything seems like such a, you know, there's so much negative in the news and on the news cycles. When you step back and you look at how far we've come and how well we we're doing to the rest uh, compared to the rest of the world, it's hard to not step out of that with a real optimism. I, f- I find that I need that sometimes. I-, I need to, like, read the cases of how much we've improved over the past hundred years to kind of suck myself out of the doldrums. But, I mean, really, the book I- I- is-, is more of a warning against turning a- against the sort of progress that we've made, not necessarily a doomsday suicide book. Yeah, no, look, I, mean, I-, I-, I have sort of, a mixed record with the titles of my books, which I wish I could sort of break out of. Um, but, uh, so I agree that it does have a little bit too much of a gloomy sound to it. Every human being is born with the same factory preset programming that a baby from 10,000 years ago had. And so we're all born barbarians. We're all born, um, uncivilized. And so the, the, the institutions that make us non-barbarians, the family, churches, synagogues, community, all these kinds of things, if they don't do their job, the whole thing falls apart. And it's amazing. You know, you talk to people, look, I, like, I understand why people like Bernie Sanders. I understand why people like Donald Trump. I understand people who think that the system needs major overhauls. All of that kind of stuff is fine. But if you just take two seconds and think, That a hundred years ago, it was normal in this country for a family to experience the death of a child. Mm. It was, I mean, it was still a tragedy, but it was normal. Calvin Coolidge's son was playing tennis on the White House tennis courts, got a blister on his foot, and died like a week later. That was normal. (laughs) Now, people still have, you know, people's kids still die every now and then, and it's, but it's all the more tragedy because it's rare compared to what it used to be. And um, in almost every single imaginable way, we have, we, you know, if, if you could pick a time in any, in any place in all of human history to be born, and you didn't know if you're going to be born, uh, you know, rich or poor, black or white, gay or straight, handicapped or not handicapped, if you, all you knew is that you could be born in a specific time, in a specific place, You'd be kind of insane not to pick the United States of America in the last, say, 10 years. And you wouldn't know that reading Twitter, which is like that scene in opening the in, in Indiana Jones where they open the Ark of the Covenant and everyone's face melts from how <laughs> horrible the world is. Yeah, I mean, and you get into that world a lot. You make a great case that it's, it's really what we have now is not the natural state of man. It's not what humanity has has experienced and been able to build on, you know, their entire time they've been around. And here we are sort of completely taking it for granted. Um, I guess in my uh, optimistic times, and this is, again, probably the same issue with your title here, is that's a somewhat of a pessimistic uh, observation, but there's a, there's a point at where I don't think we're particularly exceptional in the way that we've protected this in the past either. And the idea that this, once capitalism is unleashed, there's a part of this that, that just keeps going and going, even if you suck, even if you keep trying to screw it up, even if you put obstacle after obstacle in the road, the car still keeps moving down the road at a pretty good pace. Those improvements still seem to come. Do you have any hope that maybe we just get caught up in our day-to-day observations on 
how bad the uh, the person in charge is at any given moment. And then in reality, these things maybe have a little bit of a force behind themselves that does begin to carry it once it's unleashed. Yeah, no, I do. I, I, I think that, you know, um, America has uh, still has a lot more resilience than people think. Um, it would have had the resilience to withstand a president, Hillary Clinton. It has the resilience to withstand, you know, whatever version of Donald Trump that is freaking people out today. <laughs> um, America is still going to be OK. Um, and I, I, I think the 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 rush towards apocalyptic rhetoric, again, the title of my book, notwithstanding, um, is uh, is kind of a problem. Um, this is not to say the capitalism is perfect, right? But there and there are uh, there are reasonable things that we can do to take the edges off of capitalism to keep channeling market forces in a positive direction. Um, much of that has less to do with economic policy than it actually has to do with cultural policy. It has to do with making sure that families are intact, right? Making sure that um, civil society does the job of of modeling proper behaviors and norms that allow people to feel um, like they know what is expected of them, that they know that they belong, they know that they are valued. Um, I don't think it comes from some sort of clever, clever turning of a knob about industrial policy or what kind of tariffs we're going to have. That's almost, there's a weirdly almost Marxist sort of assumption behind this idea that you can fix the problems that we've got in the society by just sort of fixing the means of production. The reality is, is that you got to fix the cultural stuff. You hit on something that's kind of been a little bit of a back and forth among conservatives over the past few months, and it kind of bubbled up initially around porn. But this idea of, I think Ben Shapiro, ben Shapiro sort of identified it as rights-based conservatism versus common good conservatism. Um, do you think that's a fair mm -hmm. split, and which side do you fall on it? Well, so I... I I'd want to hear Ben make the fuller case about it. I, I, I'm a big believer in rights. Um, but I also think that one of the things that, that this debate, which has taken on many different forms, um, misses is that sort of rights based liberalism. And I mean by that sort of classical liberalism, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that is as much a cultural norm as is a legalistic regime. Um, mm. When we talk about enlightenment-based democracies or um, uh, liberal democracies or, or or liberal regimes and all that kind of stuff, we tend to sort of say, "Oh, it's just these abstract things that we get from John Locke and all that kind of stuff." But in reality, it's deep, deeply in, in, invested in our culture, embedded in our culture, and um, we have a very rights-based culture, and. Um, that often the sort of legalistic philosoph philosophical stuff doesn't match up with. You know, there's all this stuff that you get from some some from some of my friends on the right that John Locke steered us wrong and the Enlightenment's all wrong and all that kind of stuff. But when we actually talk about liberal countries and liberal cultures, they don't line up with Locke at all. There's you know John Locke's theories of 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 democracy are not what we practice in a day-to-day -day way in the United States of America. And so I'm still, I guess I would say is I'm more of a fusionist. I don't think it's either, or I think it's both. And, um, I've been, you know, I, I've been arguing in favor of limited selective censorship for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was like the youngest person out there 25 years ago is talking in favor of censorship. The internet has changed a lot of this because it makes it, harder but i would have no problem you know with the idea of local censorship within limits certainly about things like obscenity and pornography and all of that kind of stuff um but i think a lot of the people who have chosen to use pornography as this in larger indictment of of you know enlightenment based democracy or rights based liberalism uh it's often sort of a straw man i mean my colleague david french uh, is one of the foremost free speech um, advocates out there. He's and religious liberty advocates out there, and he's always argued that um, you can regulate things like pornography. Mm -hmm. You just got to do it in a way that's consistent with the First Amendment, and I think that's eminently doable. 
Um, I want to switch over to you have the dispatch uh, that you're over at, you're editor in chief over there now. I want to talk about the project for it a little bit, but I was reading one of the newsletters, which are great, sure. by the way, and you should definitely subscribe to them. Thank you. Um, talking about uh, the election this morning, and it, 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 it there's a sentence in there that made me really think uh, of how far the the Democrats have moved in a pretty short amount of time. We are presented with options. Uh, if you're if you're voting on the Democratic side, you're presented with options where you have Michael Bloomberg as what is what you're told is the most conservative option in the field. This is a right. quote from uh, the Morning Dispatch uh, today. Do we have that? Um, here it is. Bloomberg's entire narrative that he's a pragmatic moderate who can take the uh, head off the party's leftward uh, chain, uh, charge to ensure Democrats to defeat Donald Trump is highly suspect on the merits. A quick perusal of Bloomberg's website is enough to show that Bloomberg, were he to win the nomination, Bloomberg will be the furthest left ma major presidential candidate in modern American history. I mean, that is a remarkable statement. And I mean, especially when you look at things like guns and global warming and, and several other places, it's hard to disagree with. This is this party's come a long way. If you watch the debates over the last, you know, how many thousands of years that it's been now since this thing started, um, Obamacare is cast as this sort of right-wing, troglodytic, crazy, you know, <laughs> um, conservative thing now. It is it is astounding. Um, and I, I think that one of the things, you know, so I have this theory about how Hillary Clinton is, in fact, the most um, significant political actor of the last 50 years insofar as... Um, she was so detested and feared for good reason by so many on the right that we got, uh, the people said it's a binary choice, flight 93 election, and they voted for Hillary Clinton. They voted for Donald Trump just to a vote against Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. She was so disliked among Democrats that they almost voted for a socialist <laughs> in uh, 2016. Um, and in some ways, if the system hadn't been a little rigged, maybe Bernie would have won. But since Hillary lost, everyone is trying to fulfill fill the Bernie Sanders lane, at least until like the last two weeks. And so simply because Hillary Clinton was so indigestible, <laughs> so inconceivable as president of the United States to big swaths of the left and the right, she has managed to make the Republican Party nationalist and the Democratic Party socialist <laughs> within four years. It is an amazing thing. It's just like it, the grinders just reject the baloney on both sides. <laughs> and uh, and that is better, that I think that as much as anything else has been had this transmor transformative effect was Obama pushed the party very much to the left. And then uh, because he's the last one who won based on this theory of maximizing voter turnout, they now have this theory that that's how you have to do it every time. And so Bernie's going to do this grassroots movement. and you know, deliver class consciousness to the proletariat or something, and that will win it for them. And we are, we're left in this very polarized understanding of American politics, which is really an exception to the historical norm. Uh, before we go, you, you started the dispatch up. You're doing a couple different things here, which is interesting. You're doing something kind of different when it comes to the editorial from a lot of places where the cons where conservative media is these days. But also, as, as far as it kind of, kind of in a subscription model, you don't have to chase clickbait. You kind of get to write for more quality and instead of quantity. Can you explain you know, why you made uh, those choices? Sure. I mean, it's a long story, but the, the, the short of it is, is that um, we think that there's a lot of good stuff on the right. There's not as much reporting as we think there should be. I mean, just sort of factual, serious reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to fill that void. Um, doesn't mean there isn't any reporting. Some of it's good, but there could be more of it. Part of the, also the problem is that a lot of the reporting is, is kind of de facto in the interest of the Republican Party. It sounds like it's, you know, they're going for conservative reporting or conservative journalism, but in reality... A lot of it is sort of like opposition research against Democrats rather than like holding Republicans accountable to things. And mm -hmm. we think we could use more of that on the right. Mm -hmm. um, but we also just think our business model is uh, sort of where the future is going because so much of just whether it's on the left, the right or the center or however you want to describe the ideological part of it. The user experience of the web has become so terrible with these, where's that pop-up video coming from? How do I make this audio stop? <laughs> I don't want to see this ad for toe fungus and all of that kind of thing. Well, you don't have toe fungus. And if you had toe so fungus, much, you'd be concerned about it. 
Yeah, but you know, but you would Google search that. You okay. don't need a toe fungus <laughs> thrust upon you. And so we think that, and also just you look at how so much, how much social media drives stuff about, you know, people basically just sitting on Twitter all day looking for something to get angry about or make their readers angry and responding to it. We kind of want to like slow down the news, make the process of, of, of reading about what's going on not waste people's time or make people needlessly angry just for the sake of monetizing outrage. And um, doesn't mean everything else on the right or the left is no good. I think people should have a very diverse media diet, but we think there's a noticeable hole that we're going to try and fill for what we're talking about. No, very cool. It's, it's a really interesting project. And the dispatch is well with your time and your money. Uh, go sign up for the newsletters and everything else. Jonah Goldberg, thanks for coming on the program. You know, when you want something really, really badly, you want it more than anything in the whole world, and you think you're close to getting it, that's when a lot of times you make your biggest mistakes, right? You're so excited about it, and you can you, you almost taste it. It's so close. And then you realize you've stepped over a line and screwed everything up. Let me give you the, because uh, this is the story right here of the media with Michael Avenatti. They wanted this to be true so badly. They wanted Michael Avenatti to be this knight in shining armor to come in and save all of us from this evil, evil orange man who's bad. That's what they wanted. They wanted it so desperately. They tried to make it true. They looked past all of their normal skepticism of some charlatan off the street who's randomly representing a porn star and said, you know what? Put this guy on TV. Put him on TV every 10 seconds. Why not? He's going to take down Trump for us. Well, this is a time you make terrible decisions. Now Michael Avenatti is going to prison because he's uh, was trying to scam a shoe company out of $10 million. So what is the process now for the media? They did all this stuff. How do they deal with it now? Let me give you a little flashback about the Michael Avenatti era of, of cable news. He's Donald Trump's worst nightmare, Michael yeah. Avenatti. Joining us once again is Michael Avenatti. Let's bring in Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti, thank you very much. He's out there saving the <laughs> Look, country. It, it, Don Meacham says he may be the savior of the republic. You are something of a folk hero now. I owe Michael Avenatti an apology. I've been saying enough already, Michael. I've seen you everywhere. What do you have left to say? I was wrong, brother. You have a lot to say. <laughs> I uh, am just dying to hear what you think. These people all like you. I'm the only person right here Donald Trump fears more than Robert Miller. We think Robert you Miller. guys are the tip of the spear that's going to take down Donald Trump. Right. Michael Avenatti's a beast. Okay, that's true. And he, he's a beast. He's a beast. I hand it to yeah. her and I hand it to Michael Avenatti. But he has a great, bigger calling here that being a lawyer is minimal compared to what he's doing. No one has talked tougher directly to Donald Trump on TV than Michael Avenatti. And Donald Trump is afraid to mention his name. That's fascinating. Donald Trump is terrified of Michael Avenatti. Now, this Trump a run for his money more than anybody else, Michael Avenatti. An existential threat to the Trump presidency. The Democrats could learn something for you. You are messing with Trump a lot more than they are. He has no doubt created sheer panic in Donald Trump's very fragile mind. Michael Avenatti is laying down the law as guest co-host. And is he really thinking about running for president? Uh, one reason why I'm taking you seriously as a contender is because of your presence on cable news. You look at the field of Democrats right now and Avenatti's the one who stands out. If they decide they value a fighter most, yes. people would be foolish to underestimate yeah. Michael Avenatti. I have always said that they need a fighter. Look, I mean, we're going to continue to use the media. I think we've used it with great success. <laughs> yeah, you really have. I mean, that was long, but I, it's too good to dump out of it. The only thing that might have a little bit of credibility there is the idea that Michael Avenatti may have been better than all the other candidates because they're just terrible. Uh, so how do you deal with this if you're in the media? You've you kind of stuck your neck out, and a train came by and kind of took it off. So what do you do? Well, most media members are just going to hide from this. They're going to not apologize. They're not going to, I don't know, have a moment of reflection where you look back and you say, hey, we really screwed that up. Maybe next time we handle some random person walking in off the street uh, who's been sleeping on a park bench for the past six weeks, maybe we don't just throw them on TV next time. Most people are just going to ignore it. I will give credit to Sam Stein from uh, Daily Beast and MSNBC. Here's his tweet. I admit it. I gave Avenatti far more credibility than he deserved. I need to do better and will strive to do so. No point in trying to pretend otherwise. 
And like, look, that's what you want out of someone in the media, right? I mean, whether he actually lives up to that is, is you know, yet to be seen. But we've all made mistakes, and you, you try to, you know, if you can recognize it and admit it, uh, you're on the right path. I love this comment, though, underneath, just from some rando, who, who really encapsulated the entire media attitude towards Avenatti from the beginning. Do we have this next tweet? Yeah, here it is. We all just want Trump gone and support anything or anyone we think can do that. Well, yeah. That's what we've been saying. We, that, yes, a hundred, you're a hundred percent right. You encapsulated the entire media strategy, but that's a problem. Just wanting someone gone and doing anything or anyone to get there is uh, not exactly the right approach. Uh, we also want to uh, look at Bernie Sanders again because San <laughs> these Sanders rallies are really turning into something cool. Uh, Sanders uh, is on television a lot doing these rallies, and there's something that's happened with his followers, and this is not just Bernie followers, but anyone on the left, where they have uh, cheered on people chanting at George W. Bush and chanting at uh, Mitt Romney and chanting at D Donald Trump for so long. They've tried to step up and break up protests, and the left has cheered that on all the way. Well, now this uh, activated, hardcore left is doing this to the left's presidential candidates. And this is a bit of an issue. And I, I, I legitimately am worried about this because uh, this is a serious security issue. How many times are we going to see this happen where some random protester goes up and takes the mic from a presidential candidate with no security seemingly anywhere nearby? Here's another example of it from a rally the other day. When he's talking, someone gets up. Bernie, I'm your biggest supporter. Bernie, I'm your biggest supporter, and I'm here to ask you to stop propping up the dairy industry and to stop propping up animal agriculture. I believe in you. And then they cut the mic off. It's funny because uh, Bernie actually does look pretty pissed there. He does not want her to take the, the uh, microphone. This is the first time I've seen anybody fight it, which is at least a good thing. Um, however, afterwards, there were some topless protesters came up. They took out their udders and they said, stop milking things or something like that. It was an anti-dairy uh, protest, um, which, you know, I mean, I, most people are voting on, on dairy-based platforms, you know, pro-dairy, anti-dairy. You've, you've heard the debates. Uh, so can we see the picture? This is, the, this, is, uh, this is one of the protesters. And if you look closely, look at where Bernie's eyes are. I mean, I mean, look, at, let's be honest about it. This is what Bernie's doing. I mean, he's looking right at him. Uh, he is not thinking dairy at this point. He's, Bernie's decided to, I mean, he's basically, he's going for it here. And I don't know, if I were Bernie's uh, wife, I would be a little upset at his very constant attention to this particular issue. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope the marriage stays together though, because if, if anything else, we, we want Bernie's happiness. I think we can all agree on that. Back in a second. Let me go back to the opening monologue for a second. Uh, there was a clip we played uh, that was incredibly telling from a person most famous for having a lot of sex on television. Watch. But what he has done is taken what used to be the far left of the Democratic Party and put it dead center. <laughs> yeah. Judge her televised promiscuity all you want, and I know you are. But there's a person on Earth anywhere, is there one, that doesn't agree with what she said? She just looks at it as a positive instead of the destruction of all hope left in the world. Bernie Sanders is largely responsible for dragging his party so far to the left, it is barely recognizable. Joining me is media strategist, a writer for The Blaze, and uh, author of Woodworking with Lady Gaga and other celebrity carpentry dreams come true, it's Giancarlo Sobo. Hey. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank Can't you. wait to read it. Thanks for plugging in my book. No, no problem. So it's interesting. You kind of have a, a really interesting perspective on this. Because I really find it fascinating. I mean, Bernie Sanders ran for president in 2016, was the crazy socialist, had no chance. Yep. He, in 2013, uh, pr uh, pitched Medicare for All and got exactly zero co-sponsors, zero. Now everybody's all on board for this. This party has moved very quickly. There was a time you were a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, and you witnessed that in real time. Is this the reason you kind of moved away from the party? Yeah, so... Uh I, th I think what happened after 2016 and the Democrats got out of power and all the adults left the room 
uh, Nurse Ratched was gone and the crazies took over the insane asylum. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, look, this is a party that uh, in, in 2014, Barack Obama gave a speech where he declared income inequality the most important issue of our time, which I, I, I don't think a lot of people paid attention to it. But if you could really tell back then the, the ideological direction that the party was going and where it had shifted its focus from alleviating poverty and creating like widespread economic prosperity to focusing on inequality, which is really just the measure of two different people and how much money they make. Mm. Uh, and that really sows a lot of envy and it really takes people down a very different ideological path than if you're preoccupied with like helping the poor. And look, I mean, that's just not, those aren't my values. Um, I was yeah. on the, I was on the DNC's platform committee in 2008. I did work, uh, surrogate work for the Obama campaign in 08 and 2012 and 2016. I drove 15 hours uh, with, with my wife in the car from Virginia to Florida mm -hmm. to, to, to try to, to do some volunteer work for Hillary Clinton. And I'm gonna be voting for President Trump in November. Uh, because incredible. I do not recognize this party. It's, those aren't my values, it's not what I believe in. And uh, I, I think the Democratic Party in its current iteration uh, really needs a, a drastic makeover because you cannot have Bernie Sanders as the intellectual thought leader of the world's largest, of the world's oldest political party. That's a disgrace. <laughs> I would agree with you on that one. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible turn of events. I mean, it really has happened really quickly. And, and you look at this and there's this kind of pitch that comes from the media. We have Bernie Sanders. Yeah, he's, we know he's kind of left wing. He's, he's you know, social, democratic socialist, of course. Yeah. It's totally different. Well, sprinkles than on top. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, but there, then there's the moderate lane, the Amy Klobuchar and the Michael Bloomberg and the Pete Buttigieg. And those guys are just totally moderates. They're right down, I mean, the normal, typical Democrat. I mean, I don't think that's true. I don't even think, I mean, Bloomberg, who used to be a Republican, is a normal, moderate Democrat. Are, they, are, are any of those candidates in the realm of someone that you can consider? Definitely not on, well, no, personally, no. I'm, I'm committed to voting President Trump, but, but on cultural matters. Uh, so let's take Pete Buttigieg, for example, somebody who supports third trimester abortions, mm. cannot call himself a moderate. Now, the, the Democrats, because they control the media, uh, they're able to, well, well, they'll turn around and say, well, those abortions, A, they don't really happen, and B, if they only happen, if they do happen, it's only for some kind of life emergency or uh, fetal health issues. But that's just not true. We, we know from research data that the majority of third trimester abortions, mind you, there are about 10,000 of them each year, and that a majority of them are not, not, not for those two reasons, uh, mm -hmm. not the common exceptions, right? right. Um, so, no, when, when every single Democrat on that stage in the last debate, that's the position that they support. Uh, Amy Klobuchar was, I think, the only person who, you know, like moderate Democrats could hold out some hope for. But even in the, pe the past week now, she's saying that it was a mistake to support English as, as the official language of the country, which to me is absurd. Look, I, I am fluent in Spanish. I grew up speaking Spanish at home. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with my mother that wasn't in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Uh, she speaks perfect English, but we just communicate in Spanish with each other. Um, and I, I think it's important to have a, 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 like a, a national language. It's, it's the way people can communicate. It's, it's, it's how you preserve the heritage from one uh, generation to the other. So, of course, it's very important for people to speak English. That, it, that shouldn't be something that she turns her back on. That was, that's a very sensible position. And the same with like her other immigration positions. I mean, my first job in, one of my first jobs in politics outside of political campaigns was like writing uh, focus group scripts and writing uh, poll questions. And I clearly remember in 2009, it was a mainstream democratic position to support uh, some kind of a border wall, yeah. uh, having pe you know, people who were here, they, wanted, they didn't want to deport everybody who was here uh, illegally, but they wanted to create some process for legalization, but create an orderly process for coming legally into the country. Who supports that now on, in, in the Democratic Party? It's, it's, it's completely gone bonkers. Yeah, I mean, Klobuchar was in 2006 saying out, outwardly in debates that she wanted a, a fence. That's gone. I mean, the, the third trimester abortion thing is, 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 is fascinating. I mean, over 80% of Americans oppose it. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big percentage. Um, and, and it's not even that you know, someone like Pete Buttigieg supports it. They are now making the case that if you don't support it, you should not be in the party. Yeah. And I, I don't know, that, that's not exactly a big tent. No, it's not. I mean, they're really limiting themselves. And my fear 
is that they're doing it with significant help from uh, essentially what looks like the PR arm of of the Democratic Party, which is CNN and MSNBC and yeah. several other major news outlets. I don't, let's not say every reporter there no. is some kind of hack, but uh, certainly the machinery do, definitely does point in that direction. And it, you know, we're not we're not able to have like these honest conversations that we need to have. You're right, you're absolutely right. Most people would find third trimester abortions like disgusting mm -hmm. and morally repugnant. But that's a conversation you cannot have on national television. We have this. Con if we were to have this conversation right now on CNN, they, they would not invite us back on any of the shows. No, they'd no. probably cut us off. <laughs> you know, like you know, luckily we, Glenn has really low standards, so uh, <laughs> here at the Blaze will exist forever. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, no, I think what's happening now, just to think that there are people alive today, a lot of people, mm -hmm. who remember a time when Jack Kennedy was the head of the Democratic Party. So like to it's, go from totally different. Yeah, to go like from Jack Kennedy, who actually like killed communists, to Bernie Sanders, who partied with communists <laughs> yeah. in like one lifetime. Yeah, imagine that. You know. Um, so we have about thirty seconds left. You, you're a media guy. You, you, you message things for a living. You've been doing this for a while. How? What's an effective message to someone who's on the fence as a Democrat to come over to the Republican side? Uh, look, y you, you have to tell them. You, you have to let them know. These are your values. Yeah. This is and what's happening now in the Democratic Party. Those aren't your values, right? Yeah. Your values are at home with the conservative movement, uh, which is which is a big tent party, which uh, the conservatives do uh, do open their doors to a lot of people. Um, and you just show them the insanity also of like the Bernie crowd and how they they attack people. Yeah. And I think the nine month thing really does help because it is as terrible as a policy is it just puts such a stark contrast. We had said it there. Uh, John Carlos Sobo, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Back in a second. I want to thank you again for uh, following this podcast and going on all the social stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you clicking follow and subscribe to all this nonsense. Uh, we try to have uh, a, a good time and, and, and give you some news from the day and, and make you not want to hang yourself. It's, it's the minor goal we're going for. I don't know if we'll ever get there. We're trying. Uh, but we were able to rise up to number 11 on iTunes as a podcast. We're, uh, you know, adding uh, subscribers and followers uh, at YouTube as well. And please just go and subscribe, rate and review, do all that stuff. And I know it's a little bit of homework and I know it's a little bit annoying, but I do appreciate it. And if you go to blazetv.com, use the promo code STU, um, you can get 10 bucks off your subscription. Uh, that's always uh, very cool because there you get kind of all the shows, you get all the behind the scenes stuff. We're going to start doing some stuff for subscribers only here at some point once we can figure out how to do this show and not have me screw it up every time. Uh, once we get there, we're going to be doing some of that stuff as well. So we do really appreciate it. We did uh, notice this one tweet from Barack Obama today. Uh, this is uh, from Barack. He says, 11 years ago today, near the bottom of the worst recession in generations, I signed the Recovery Act, paving the way for more than a decade of economic growth and the longest streak of job creation in American history. Uh, so he was very proud of himself. We did look kind of a little bit closer at this. And if you look really close... You'll notice the pen he signed that with, and I did not know they had this, this bad of a relationship. He signed it apparently with a Nancy Pelosi sucks pen, which is odd because I didn't really realize they existed at that point, uh, but they're a collector's item and obviously everyone should own one. Nancy Pelosi sucks pen.com. Uh, we do appreciate you rating and reviewing the uh, program and uh, you've seen it. <laughs> Legitimately, you guys cracked me up because there's been like hundreds of reviews of people just saying, it's great. Whatever. Five stars. Eh. I love it. Keep them coming. It's stewdoesamerica.com. You can get all the links uh, to everything I'm blabbing about here. All right. We'll see you tomorrow.